A reading from the book of the prophet Baruch. Jerusalem, take off your robe of mourning and misery. Put on the splendor of glory from God forever. Wrapped in the cloak of justice from God, bear on your head the mitre that displays the glory of the eternal name. For God will show all the earth your splendor. You will be named by God forever, the peace of justice, the glory of God's worship. Up, Jerusalem, stand upon the heights. Look to the east and see your children gathered from the east and the west at the word of the Holy One, rejoicing that they are remembered by God. Led away on foot by their enemies, they left you. But God will bring them back to you, borne aloft in glory as on royal thrones. For God has commanded that every lofty mountain be made low, and that the age-old depths and gorges be filled to level ground, that Israel may advance secure in the glory of God. The forest and every fragrant kind of tree have overshadowed Israel at God's command. For God is leading Israel in joy by the light of his glory, with his mercy and justice for company. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. from the letter of St. Paul to the Philippians. Brothers and sisters, <coughs> I pray always with joy in my every prayer for all of you because of your partnership for the gospel from the first day until now. I am confident of this, that the one who began a good work in you will continue to complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. God is my witness, how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, that your love may increase ever more and more in knowledge and every kind of perception to discern what is of value so that you may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ for the glory and praise of God. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. In the fifteenth year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, and Herod was tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip tetrarch of the region of Iteria and Trachonitis, and Licinius was tetrarch of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the desert. John went throughout the whole region of the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one crying out in the desert, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight his paths. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be made low. The winding roads shall be made straight, and the rough ways made smooth. And all flesh shall see the salvation of God. The Gospel of the Lord. A 
Okay, the distinction might not be readily apparent, but it'll become apparent. You can do it in any field, sports, politics, whatever. But in this field, okay, what's the difference between, here's one group of musicians. On the left, on this side, on your right side, we have, the list includes um, Charlie Daniels, the country western guy. Clarence Clemens, uh, the boss's great saxophone player. And the boss himself, Bruce Springsteen. That's on one hand. And on the other side is Billy Ray Cyrus. Hint, this is the good group. No comment. So here's what they have in common, and here's how they differ from this guy. Every one of those people on the left-hand side over there, every one of those people, they at some point were really kind to my little sister. <laughs> Charlie Daniels, at, after a concert, we went and visited Charlie Daniels backstage, and I've told you that story before. She came out of there with his hat, <laughs> his vest, and every record he'd ever made. Clarence one time came and spent a whole afternoon at the house. It was great. I have a picture in the sack just because it was one of the happiest days of her life. And the boss was really sweet. A couple of times he had her into his house and um, gave her records and it was Halloween party and she stayed for dinner or whatever. Well, she didn't want to leave. I mean, who would, right? Billy Ray Cyrus? We had one of these backstage passes at Radio City when Billy Ray was performing at Radio City and there were a couple of people there who were supposed to meet the celebrity and I thought he was kind of a drip to start with. But there we sat and he got one look at her and could tell you know, that she had Down syndrome and clearly was not interested in stopping. You know what I mean? Like, keep moving. So when that daughter of his, Miley Cyrus, got into all sorts of trouble with Hollywood and the police, I should have, I should have been a better Christian, but I was gloating just a little bit. Okay, I got to tell you. I got to tell you. It's the matter of the ones that we love mattering to other people. You know how it is. You know when you're, if you have little children in school, you know that if your kid matters, truly matters to the teacher, or it doesn't really matter, the teacher's just gone through the motions, right? You know how it is when your kids are getting coached, that does, does, my, does my child's you know, experience of this game really matter to this guy or not? And nine times out of ten, for the teachers, yeah, they really care. And you know how it is with the coaches, too. And if you have a loved one in, you know, getting medical attention, or you're getting medical attention, you know that, you know, this one really cares. I really matter to this one, or my loved one matters to this one. And it makes all the difference in the experience. And you get that outlier. Thank heavens they're so infrequent. But you get those ones who transmit the message, you know what? It's a case of mind over matter. I don't mind, you don't matter, right? And you get tired of it. It's not, it's not that much fun to be around. I think the pinnacle experience of that for me was after our parents died and I was trying to arrange stuff for Judith's future, and I kept going from place to place to get the plan all squared away, and they kept, you know, like, it was really dismissive, and you'd meet the bureaucrats, and I get it, bureaucrats are entitled to bad days, but they, you know, say, no, can't help you, can't help you, and I'm thinking, can you just act, can you pretend that you care that you can't help? And then it was the Feast of the Immaculate Conception a whole bunch of years ago when I went to this office in Trenton at the Department of at the DHS, the Division of Human Services, and stumbled into the presence of this lady who turned out to be our angel and our saint, Maureen Gonzalez. We'll never forget it. And she convinced me that even in state bureaucracies, you can find people who care, people to whom you matter. And you know how it goes. When someone transmits the message, you matter or your loved one matters, it changes everything. And when someone gives you the impression you don't matter, not so good. Today's readings remind us that God has put in each one of us that hope that we will matter to other people and to God. Yeah, we can get neurotic and carried away and be big babies about it, you know, that um, no, you know, nobody cares about me, I don't get enough attention, whatever it is, uh, pipe down, Herman, you know, you're getting all the attention you need. But that basic human desire that I will matter, not to everyone on the whole planet, but I'll matter to certain people and I'll matter to God. And that, that, that happens in us. And that's of God. That's the way God built us. And we have the hope that we will. So in the first reading today, we get the story of Baruch. Baruch is a little known author in the, in the Bible. Baruch is what we call, um, the book of Baruch is what we call apocryphal apocryphal, meaning it's in the Catholic Bible, but it's not in the Jewish Bible, and it's not in the Protestant Bible, okay? It's only in the Catholic Bible. Now, Baruch, we don't know a whole lot about him, but we do know that he's associated with Jeremiah, 
So if he's associated with Jeremiah, then he is associated with the exile. And if he's associated with the exile, he's associated with a whole bunch of people who had it deep down in their souls. Nobody cares about us. Right? Because they'd gotten thrown off their land. The temple was destroyed by, uh, by Nebuchadnezzar in 587 B.C. Nothing that, that was really of importance to them was surviving. Their home, their temple, their relationships, nothing. And they got themselves deported. And off they go to Babylon. And in that circumstance, they are, they are refugees who've been chased off their land, dragged off their land. And how can you help but feel like nobody cares? But today's passage changes that message. And Baruch and evidently Jeremiah, sent by God, know that that's a really important message. It's a very, very important message for the people to hear. You do matter. Baruch addresses four different groups. He addresses the people in the, of the, um, what they call the Anawim, the people in the, in the, the, the sort of have moved away during all the hubbub and they took up residence in different corners of the ancient Middle East. So he's addressing them in one group. And then he's addressing the exiles in another letter. In this part today, he's actually addressing the people who stayed behind in Jerusalem. And he says, up Jerusalem, stand up, look to the east. Now the east is the direction from which the, the refugees would be returning. And notice what God has done for you and notice what God has done for them. Because you do matter to God. And God's going to bring these people back. And God's going to restore Jerusalem. And God's going to restore your life. Because things have gotten so bad, you have become convinced, understandably, nobody cares about you. In the grand scheme of things, you don't matter. And when you hear that enough from other people, of course, you start to wonder, well, do we matter to God? And then comes the big payoff line in today's first reading, that you will be rejoicing because you are remembered by God. You will be rejoicing because you will be remembered by God. That's big news. God has not forgotten you. God cares. You matter to God. The quality of your life matters to God. Up, Jerusalem, look, here they come. And in, you, in all of that, notice, you never got off God's radar screen. Hard to believe that sometimes, but you never got off God's radar screen. You've always mattered to God. In the gospel today, we get a similar situation where there's a people, there's a group of people who all together feel like they really don't matter. They've had a whole bunch of people tell them, you don't matter, you don't matter, you don't matter. And then comes the moment when someone sent by God has the message for them, no, you really do matter. And so the first bunch of names, now this is the third chapter of Luke's gospel. The first two chapters, though, the first chapter is the annunciations to John the ba about John the Baptist and about Jesus. The second chapter is basically the birth of Christ and the, and the childhood of Christ. Then we get to the third chapter. That's where we are today. It's the start of John's public ministry. And so Luke sets the stage by saying, here's what's going on in the world. Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate, uh, Lysanias, I'm sorry, Herod the Tetrarch, Herod the Tetrarch, also known as Herod Antipas, Philip, Lysanias, Annas, and Caiaphas. What do they all have in common? They don't care. The people of Israel do not matter to them. They couldn't care less. Take a look. Tiberius Caesar, one goal. He want, he's the second emperor. He's the, he got to be the emperor. He'd been, that's it's not that important. Caesar Augustus was the first emperor. He lasted for 40 years, and then along came Tiberius Caesar, and he was sort of a stepson of, um, of Caesar Augustus. He couldn't care less about the people of, of Palestine. They were good for one thing only, tax revenue. And expansion of empire, because remember, Tiberius Caesar had it in the back of his head. He wanted his empire to be as big someday as Alexander's, Alexander the Great's was. That, was. that was the gold standard. So what, what do we care about the children of Israel? Nothing. Next in line, that Luke mentions in today's gospel. After Tiberius Caesar, we get Pontius Pilate. How much did he care about the people of Israel? He wanted to be any place but in Israel, right? It's like somebody who joins the Navy because they think they're going to get sent on an exotic cruise to Fiji, and they end up with, uh, like, Fort Dix or something, right? Big disappointment. He wanted to be someplace else. He wanted nothing to do with that job assignment. But he had to take it, and he did it. He didn't care about the people. And he was abusive, and he was mean, and he was nasty. Just read Josephus, the historian. Next in line, Tiberius, okay, check, doesn't care. Caesar, or Tiberius doesn't care. Herod doesn't care. 
and Pilate doesn't care. Then comes Herod, Herod Antipas, son of Herod the Great. Remember, Herod the Great had just converted to Judaism in his own life, or Herod the Great's father converted to Judaism, not because of the faith, but because of the financial opportunities. So that goes down from father to son to son. Herod the Great made it very clear at many moments, he doesn't really care about the people of Israel. He's just there for what it can do for him. Okay, he doesn't care either. Then come some of the other names. They're um, on the same level as Herod the Tetrarch. And then comes Annas and Caiaphas. And we know that on a good day, they cared about their people, but a lot of days they really didn't. They just wanted to preserve the dynasty. Annas, the father-in-law, Caiaphas, the son-in-law, we've got to keep this ship afloat of our power. So in the middle of all these people who don't care at all, to whom the people of Israel do not matter, comes John the Baptist. And John the Baptist goes out and preaches all sorts of places in all sorts of inconvenient places that are not easy to get to. And he says, repent. And the reason he says, he's saying, repent because God cares about you. God wants you to get to heaven. God wants you to go in the right direction. And God loves you enough to send me and I care about you enough to deliver the message. So make different choices, children of Israel. Take it from someone who truly, truly cares about you and then take it from someone who's the herald of someone else who cares about you more than you can ever imagine. All of those voices that said to all the people on the margins in ancient Israel, you don't matter, you don't matter, and you don't matter. You got a disease that we can't name, you don't matter, go away. We just get, get out of here, scram. You, you've committed a sin that we don't like, go away, come on, scram. You don't matter anymore. You used to matter, but now you don't matter. You think you're possessed by a demon? Scram, because we don't want you infecting the rest of the community. You don't matter, you don't matter, you don't matter. Whole populations, whole segments of the population, you don't matter. And then Jesus comes along and says, you know what? You got leprosy, you matter to me. In fact, you matter extra. You, you got a demon going on, you matter extra. You, women, you've you've been pushed off to the side, you matter extra to me. Just read Luke's gospel. Over and over and over again, John delivers the message, Jesus delivers the message, you matter to me and you matter to my father. And that business about you not mattering and nobody cares, it's a big fat lie that the dark side wants you to believe because once you believe it, you start to make lousy choices. When you think that God doesn't care about you, when you think that other people don't care about you, then you'll start to make choices and you will self-destruct and everybody loses on that deal. So where are we in that story? We're on both sides of the story. Mostly we're on the good side of the story. And the good side of the story is because of you, people who would otherwise feel that nobody cares and they matter to no one don't feel that way. There are people in your life right now going on who, if it weren't for you, they'd feel like they didn't matter. They didn't matter to other people and they didn't matter to God. When someone's going through a really, really rough time, they don't, need, don't always need someone to fix it. They need someone to be there. They need someone to stand at the foot of the cross. And if you have the, you have the strength of character to stand at the foot of the cross, what you're saying to that other person is, you matter to me. And God works in that statement in magnificent ways. We can't always change the other person's circumstances. We can be with them and say, whatever's going on in your life, you matter to me and you matter to God. Parents, you do that all the time with your kids. Kids who are taking care of elderly parents, you do it all the time. The routine says that. Your inspired routine to the day in and the day out stuff, you're saying to other people, you really matter. And there are people, if it weren't for you, wouldn't feel that way. They'd feel as lost as the children of the exile. They'd feel as lost as the children of Israel under the direction of Pilate and Tiberius Caesar. And so God sends you into the picture. I'd ask you to notice one place where you're really getting it right. Where you've really, truly helped someone to believe that despite their circumstances and despite the difficulties and their history and their questionable future, you're with them because they matter to you. You're not going to let them be forgotten. You're not going to let them suffer alone. You're going to be there with them. It's an enormous channel of grace. One place where you're truly, truly getting that right. Second place, one place we need to take the next step, and we all have that. And in the purple season, we pay extra attention to it. 
someone who maybe does feel a little bit at the edge or maybe feels like totally bereft. Someone who thinks, you know what, I don't think anybody cares. And you can't save the world. If you leave here trying to save the world, then, that's, then you're in the grip of the dark angels. Nobody can save the world. That's not the call. The call is to take that little next step. And maybe there's some way, some opportunity I have, I'm aware of it, God's nudging me, and I can do something about it. As Baruch did for the children of the exile, as John the Baptist and Jesus did for the children of Israel, you deliver the message, you know what, I do care. And it's not the kind of thing where we say, you know, dear Fred, uh, you matter to me, Merry Christmas, love, bozo. No. It's that we clarified in our hearts that that person really matters. And when we clarified in our hearts, it inevitably comes through the communication. Inevitably. So one place where you just need to square away in your heart, you know what, I act as if that person doesn't matter and they really do. One place where you're getting it right, one place where you can work it on, on it a little bit. And remember the really consoling thing, no pressure here. The more we get lined up with this group, huh? those who really transmit the message, you matter. And the less we spend time in the other group of you don't matter. From God's perspective, that makes us a whole lot more like Bruce Springsteen, Clarence Clemens, and Charlie Daniels, and a whole lot less like Miley Cyrus and her father. And after all, which group would you rather belong to? No pressure. So for all of us, what is, it, what is it that you do on a regular basis that makes someone feel like they matter? Huh? They really do. And if it weren't for you, they might feel kind of left out or just neglected or not part of the world at large or like they're going through it alone and God doesn't want people going through it alone. God really doesn't want that. And because of you, there's someone out there who doesn't feel alone. They feel like they do matter. They feel like someone does care. It's not about saving the world. It's about doing our bit with the people in our orbits. One place where you're getting it very, very right. You're doing a bang-up job. And there's probably 20 places you could name. One way in which perhaps God is saying, could you take that next step, please? I'd, I'd, I'd like to send Jesus, but I already did that once, and now I'm sending you. So you take his place. And just like he said to people, you matter even if you don't think so. Step up your game a little bit, just in that one circumstance. huh? Where are you getting it right? Where's the next step in conveying God's message? You do matter. Let us pray.